especially given that cancer is clearly something banal, mundane, every day, if it's affecting one in three of us. Exactly, and the number of people, uh, at least 45% of people with cancer are actually cured of their illness, and a lot more live with it for many, many years into old age, and that's where the changes have come from and where they're going to. Carol, there's a lot of diseases that get bundled together as cancers. What mm. unites them? What differentiates them? It's growth control. Uh, Cancer is a disorder of growth, so the normal growth pattern that makes a baby grow repairs our wounds if we cut ourselves, if you cut your finger. The same molecules, the same cogs in the cell go wrong, and they make cancer cells grow uncontrollably to form a lump, to spread around the body, to grow in other organs, and eventually it's not the cancer where it first arises that usually kills people, it's because it spreads around the body. Uh, and that process is called metastasis from the Greek change of place. In this part of toxicity testing, we're going to look at carcinogenicity tests. To enable this, let's first look at the OECD test 451 for carcinogenicity. Part 30 of the OECD test 451 tells the animal technicians how they are to dose the animals in the carcinogenicity studies. It reads... In the case of oral administration, the animals are dosed with the test substance daily, seven days per week, normally for a period of 24 months for rodents. Any other dosing regime, e.g. five days per week, needs to be justified. In the case of dermal administration, animals are normally treated with the test substance for at least six hours per day, seven days per week, as specified in TG4110, for a period of 24 months. Exposure by the inhalation route is carried out for six hours per day, seven days per week, but exposure for five days per week may also be used, if justified. The period of exposure will normally be for a period of 24 months. If rodent species other than rats are exposed nose only, maximum exposure durations may be adjusted to minimise species-specific distress. A rationale should be provided when using exposure duration less than six hours per day. The acute systemic toxicity tests are thought of as the worst as regards to pain and suffering to the test species. However, these long-term chronic toxicity tests are pretty horrendous as well. After the tests have been undertaken, the test results are then analysed to determine what, if any, adverse effects occur at the different exposure levels. This is known as dose-response assessment. In the dose-response assessment you should be looking to identify the null value, which is the lowest exposure level at which no adverse effects are observed, the low value, which is the lowest observed adverse effect level, and the BMD, which stands for benchmark dose. The benchmark dose is a dose that produces a small increase in the level of adverse effects. If you look at the bottom bullet point, you will see that it says relevance to humans. It is this relevance to humans that I'm going to look at now. For instance, do the test results gleaned from carcinogenicity tests extrapolate accurately to humans? That is, do chemicals and drugs that are carcinogenetic to rats and mice also appear to be carcinogenetic to humans? To answer this question we will look at a research paper, some empirical evidence and the views of some scientists. The research paper I'm going to look at is Knight, Bailey and Bolcom's three-part research paper on animal carcinogenicity. Despite the heavy reliance for the last several decades on rodent carcinogenicity data in the regulation of human exposures, the conventional rodent bioassay has never been formally validated against human data. On the contrary, validation studies have found the rodent bioassay to be lacking in human specificity, i.e. in the ability to identify human non-carcinogens, resulting in false positive outcomes, or even human sensitivity, i.e. the ability to detect human carcinogens at all. What this means is the rodent 
bioassay isn't sensitive enough to detect some human carcinogens. This abstract was taken from the International Archives of Occupational and Environmental Health and it's about asbestos. The parts underlined in red read Inhalation experiments with rats need fiber exposure concentrations over a hundred times higher to match the lung cancer risk of asbestos workers and about a thousand times higher to reach the same methothelioma risk. Methothelioma is a type of cancer you only get from asbestos. The last line reads, also underlined in red, it can be concluded that the rat inhalation model is also not sensitive enough to predict the cancer risk of other fibre types for humans, i.e. it lacks sensitivity. However, the really big problem with the rodent bioassay is its lack of specificity. What this means is it massively overpredicts what is going to be carcinogenic to humans, i.e. it generates false positives. In a study published in the journal Mutagenesis, it was found that of 20 known human non-carcinogens, 19 were known animal carcinogens. In other words, you would have found 19 false positives in such a test. False positives can be seen as false alarms. This is further emphasised in this slide. It reads, Raal estimated that only 10% of chemicals are truly carcinogenic to humans. And Ashby and Purchase speculated that all chemicals eventually display some carcinogenic activity if tested in sufficient rodent strains. Even common table salt has been classified as a tumour promoter in rats. But John, <laughs> can almost anything be, be poisonous to success? You know that old saying from parents, you know, too much of a good thing can be bad for you. Is that, does that actually turn out to be true? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, you, you can kill yourself with water. I mean, people who've been starved of water, you know, been out in the desert, who suddenly given access to vast quantities of water, gulp it down and die, because, of course, they absorb too much water and it disturbs the ionic balance of their blood and so their heart stops so you can poison yourself even Black with Black Beauty water. nearly died from drinking too much water I remember from my childhood as well but that's in the well, story Yes you can, I mean Paracelsus 400 years ago actually said the dose makes the poison Right. Uh, and we know for example certain things that are absolutely essential to us like selenium that's an element that we do need uh, too much selenium of course will poison you it's known to do that um, and the same with arsenic, it, it, it's still possible that arsenic is an essential element for human life mm. the, the uh, jury is out on that one yet but they've done experiments with chickens, for example. Chickens raised with no arsenic in their diet didn't grow properly, and when arsenic was restored to their diet, then they did begin to grow properly again. So long-term ingestion of arsenic, even in small doses, will lead to cancer. This slide shows the problem of including rats and mice in your bioassay. It reads, male rats appear to be more susceptible to tumorigenesis than females, but the situation was reversed in mice. De Carlo similarly found that of 61 chemicals causing cancer in mice or rats, only 13, that was 21.3%, were carcinogenic in both male and female mice and rats. De Carlo concluded that it is painfully clear that carcinogenesis in the mouse cannot now be predicted from positive data obtained from the rat and vice versa. In other words, rats are not predictive of what will be carcinogenic in mice, and mice are not predictive of what will be carcinogenic in rats. This slide shows the difficulties of getting alternatives to rat or mice bioassays accepted by the regulatory authorities. It reads, for the most part, fear of lack of acceptance of alternatives by regulatory agencies is discouraging the use of alternative assays. Consequently, the conventional two-year, both genders, two rodent species, usually mice and rats, bioassay, persists, despite extensive criticism centred on its very poor human specificity and its subsequent inability to meet the stringent human validation standards required of alternative protocols. So what's the answer? 
Knight, Bailey and Balcom recommend epidemiological research as one answer. After all, this is how the link between smoking and lung cancer was discovered, as well as the link between asbestos and mesothelioma. Knight, Bailey and Balcom also recommend that cancer centres should be funded to establish tumour registries aimed at identifying new information on lifestyle, occupational, environmental and medical carcinogens. In this last slide, Knight, Bailey and Balcom go on to recommend other alternatives to the rodent bioassay. This slide reads, in contrast with animal bioassays, both their human specificity and sensitivity of alternatives such as QSAR computerized systems and in vitro assays are very promising. Non-animal alternatives may also yield results nearly instantaneously in the case of QSAR computerized systems or in as little as six hours in the case of enhanced SHE in vitro protocols compared with two years for conventional rodent bioassays. Other advantages include potentially enormous savings of financial and personal resources, substantial replacement of animal use, and requirements for only tiny quantities of test chemicals. Inexplicably, however, in the face of their very substantial potential for increasing human specificity, productivity, and overall efficiency, the regulatory agencies have been frustratingly slow to adopt alternative protocols preferring to cling to the bioassay traditions that yield results of poor human specificity and productivity at great cost and after two or more years. Uh, the final study that I'm going to discuss uh, looked at the ability of animal tests to predict cancer-causing <coughs> agents in humans. They found that the animal tests were poorly predictive and that there was wide disagreement over whether they could be relied upon and what the results actually meant. Indeed, under the right conditions, any uh, compound can be shown to be carcinogenic using the right, under the right circumstances. In fact, one study showed that of 20 chemicals known to be safe in humans, a fully 19 caused cancer in rodents. So that doesn't seem terribly reliable. Well, there are three books full of examples of real harm that has happened to humans because of our reliance on animal experiments. Famous ones, for example, are that if we relied on animal experiments, we would be smoking freely, believing that it was actually quite good for us. We would be eating a high-fat diet in the belief that uh, it wouldn't cause us heart disease. We wouldn't have any qualms about breathing in asbestos or glass fibers. And these are just some of the examples. Smoking was thought to be non-carcinogenic for years because we cannot reproduce lung cancer in dogs. High cholesterol diets were recommended. Indeed, we were giving high cholesterol, high fat diets to patients who had just suffered heart attacks. Asbestos and many other environmental induced cancers were given to the general public with, without any hesitation because of studies done in animals. And again, we can go on and on and on down the list. To, to put it in a little bit more modern context, this is a study from Science in 1997. And the National Cancer Institute tested 12 drugs that were currently being used successfully to treat cancer in humans. And they studied mice that were called nude mice or xenograft mice. And these mice were growing the same cancers that these drugs were used to treat. And indeed, they were human cancers because they took a, a bit of the human cancer and planted it into the mouse. The mouse would grow it, and then the scientists would give the mouse the, the appropriate drug. Well, what this study shows is that 30 out of 48 times, the drugs were ineffective. Okay, So 63% of the time, even though we knew that these drugs were effective in treating human cancer, they were ineffective in treating mouse cancer. Now, this same article goes on to suggest that perhaps we have lost cures for cancer because they were ineffective in mice. Okay, that's the National Cancer Institute saying that. That's not me.